Shall we start, Dr. Rishad? Yes, sure. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Nishad, for uh, joining us for today. And this is the second session for today and uh, uh, for a 10th session uh, for the workshop. Dr. Nishad uh, Afshan Ansari has done a BE from Government Engineering College, Amravati in 2002, MTech and PhD from VNIT Nagpur in 2009 and 2018, respectively, all in computer science and engineering. She has teaching experience of 17 years. Since last three years, she is a faculty member in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at IIIT Nagpur. Earlier, she has worked as a faculty member at VNIT Nagpur and RCOEM Nagpur. She is a top rank holder in MTech. She is also a recipient of gold medal and has won the Padma Shri Dr. Khalil Ulla Award for Outstanding Performance in Academics. Her research interest includes artificial intelligence, machine learning, and wireless sensor network. We are proud to have you, Dr. Nishad, for this particular session. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation and uh, being here. Thank you so much. Thank Over you, Dr. Pooja, for having me here, and uh, thank you for a nice introduction. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, should I share my presentation? Yes, slides? please. Yes. Is it visible? Yes, ma'am, it is visible. You can start. Yeah. So a very good morning. Uh, today's topic is artificial neural networks. And this is the outline for today's presentation. We will look at what is perceptron, decision surface of a perceptron. Then we will see representation power of a perceptron. We will see what are the training rules used for training these perceptrons and neural networks. So we will, in particular, we'll be seeing perceptron training rule and delta training rule, which uses gradient descent. We will also look at multilayer networks and the back propagation algorithm. So this is the agenda for today. So let us start. So a perceptron, what's a perceptron is? A perceptron is a basic or primitive unit in artificial neural network. We can understand this perceptron with the help of this diagram, which is shown over here. So it will it, it has two components. One is this linear function, and other is this uh, threshold function. What it actually does it it takes inputs in the form of x1, x2, xn, up to xn, whatever number of input features are there, and applies the corresponding weights and computes a linear function over it. So we can see this summation i equals to 0 to n wi xi. This is the linear function computed by this linear unit of this perceptron, right? We also have an additional input here, which we denote by x0, which is always equals to 1. And the corresponding weight we are denoting here by w0. Sometimes this additional input is also known as the bias. So to give you an example of what kind of inputs could be taken by this perceptron is let's consider an example of classifying the patients who are, are having high risk of high, uh, heart disease and low risk of heart disease. High risk patients versus low risk patients. In this case, what would be your inputs? Your input could be the age of the patient, right? Then the gender of the patient, blood pressure, cholesterol level, etc. So these are the inputs that we are feeding to this this perceptron. So these x1, x2, x3, x up to xn are nothing but these input features, which is also known as input features, which we feed into this network or this primitive unit of the network. It takes all these inputs, take this bias also as input, along with all the weights, computes this linear function, and gives this output this threshold unit. The threshold unit takes this linear function's value and gives an output as one if the value of this linear function is greater than zero. Otherwise, it outputs minus one. So we can say a patient, uh, we can divide the patient into two classes one belonging to this positive class, other belonging to 
negative class. So positive class are the patient which are having the high risk and negative class are the patients which are having the low risk. So using this simple perceptron, we can implement this particular application, right? So this is the basic uh, idea about the perceptron. So as I said, that perceptron represent linear function. This we have already seen. This linear function, if the linear functions, if the this linear functions output goes to the threshold unit, and if that value is greater than zero, the output of the perceptron will be equals to plus one, otherwise it will be minus one. Right? We can also write it in the form of vector. All weights could be represented by using this vector. So I have uh, written it in the old case where there is a vector involved. So this you please interpret it like this w arrow, right? So whenever the output of this linear function is greater than zero, thresholded output is greater than zero, then output of the threshold unit will be plus one, otherwise it is minus one. Right, so same thing is written over here. So what this learning problem is, the learning problem is basically learning these weights. See, we know the inputs, right? We know all these inputs x1, x2, x3, because they are also already given in the problem statement. We are also given the corresponding output for each patient. In the training data, the input values for every patient will be given, as well as whether that patient belongs to high risk class or low, low risk class, that is its label is also given to you, right? So x, xi's are known, right? And the corresponding output is, uh, is also known. So the precise learning pro problem is essentially uh, learning about the about these weights. That means if we can come up with appropriate weights, which can give us the desired result, then the learning problem is solved. So our objective is to learn these weights. So let us look at the decision surface of a perceptron. So we can look at this perceptron as representing a um, decision surface. What do we mean by decision surface? We can see this diagram over here in which we have a problem statement where there are only two input features, X1 and X2, right? And there are two classes of the um, instances. What do we mean by instances? See, for example, if I talk of a patient and the patient has various features, X1, X2, X3, up to Xn, right? So this is patient one. Similarly, for patient two, patient three, there could be n number of patients or m number of patients, right? So each patient is nothing but an instance, right? So this diagram actually is representing the parts of various instances, and therefore this diagram is called as the instance space, right? So once once you have your perceptron, this perceptron represents a decision surface, and you will come up with this hyperplane in such a way that on one side of this hyperplane, all the examples, all the instances will belong to one particular class. So we can see all these instances belong to positive class. Whereas all these instances on the other side of perceptron, they belong to negative class. Right? So this perceptron represent this decision surface and in the examples or in the applications where the instances are such that that your hyperplane could separate them perfectly, then we call those examples as linearly separable. Why? Because all the examples are perfectly classified by the hyperplane, which is learned by the Perceptron. So the examples here are linearly separable, right? There could be certain applications where the instance uh, examples or instances may not be linearly separable. An example is shown over here. So if you could see here the positive and negative instances, you could see this positive instance, you could see here the negative instances also. 
can you draw any straight line which could perfectly classify these training examples? That means on one side of that straight line, all positive examples should be there. And on the other side of that straight line, all negative examples should be there. Can we draw such a line? No, the answer is no. There is no such line possible for this particular example, which can perfectly classify all these positive and negative examples. So such examples are known as linearly non-separable. And the understanding of linearly separable and linearly non-separable classes are very important or, or examples are very important because that will actually decide that what kind of network we can design, right? So let's proceed. And once now we have understood the concept of perceptron, let's see the representational power of perceptron. That means what kind of functions can be represented using perceptron. So the kind of function that could be represented using perceptron is all uh, primitive Boolean operations like and, and or, NAND, NOR, etc. So let's see some of the examples. So for example, let's say we want to implement and Boolean function using the perceptron. So we know the perceptron takes, uh, the AND function takes the in two inputs, x1 and x2. And here we have listed all four, uh, all four um, in possible combinations of these inputs. And this is the output of the AND Boolean function. So for first three rows, it is zeros. And for one, one, it will output one, right? And as per our definition of the perceptron that we had seen in the first slide, the perceptron outputs a uh, uh, plus one when the when you have the output of the linear function as positive. So basically, what do we want? We have two classes here. Let's consider that this is the negative class, and let's consider that this is the positive class. That means we want the perceptron to output a plus one in this case. And in these three cases, the perceptron should output minus one. That's we want, right? So we have these inputs. We have the corresponding output for each of these inputs, right? These are our instances. Instance one, two, three, four. Four instances are there. Their corresponding outputs are also known. And we also know that this is the linear function that we have. So how the linear function's value will be computed? W0 plus W1X1 plus W2X2. I can write it like this also, W0, X0, W1X1, W2X2. Here I have not written X0 because X0 is always equals to one. So it is one and the same thing, right? So we know all X size, right? We need to find out the appropriate WIs such that the perceptron will output these values. So what could be the possible bits, right? Let's let's see. So one of the possible weight vector will be something like this, something like this. W0 is equals to minus 0.8, W1 equals to 0.5, and W2 equals to 0.5. So let's see for the first training example where X1 equals to zero and X2 equals to zero, right? And we know that our function is W0 plus W1X1 plus W2X2. So if I put these values of weights and these values of exercise, so W0 is minus 0.8, W1 is 0.5 into 0 plus 0.5 into 0. So this is essentially minus 0.8, which is less than 0. So the perceptron output will be minus 1. In the same way, you can work out for this, for this. So you'll find the linear functions output for the input 0, 1, and the same weight vector will be equals to minus 0.3, which is a value which is less than 0. And therefore, the perceptron's output will be equals to minus 1, right? In the same way, this is also less than 0. Therefore, the perceptron's output will be equals to minus 1. And for the last instance, all the training example, the, the linear function's output is 0.2, which is greater than zero. Therefore, 
the perceptron's output is equal to plus one. And that's exactly what we wanted. We wanted that perceptron should output minus one for the first three instances or first three examples, and it should output a one for the last example. So we have successfully implemented the AND Boolean function using the perceptron. I hope uh, all of you with me. Right, so this, nice. so let's proceed. Yeah, thank you. So let's proceed. So now I have a simple uh, exercise for you. Um, just the way we have implemented the AND Boolean function, we can implement all Boolean function as well, right? So we have this input for possible combination of two values, x1 and x2. The OR function's output, which will be zero for the first case when both the inputs are zero, otherwise it will be equal to one. And what do we want for the perceptron to do for us? We want that perceptron should output a minus one in the first case, because this is the negative class. And in the remaining cases, it should output plus one because these are positive classes, right? Again, XIs are known, outputs are known. What do we need to know is WIs. So what could be the possible ways? Any guesses for implementation of our function? Could you guess the weights that will implement this OR function? Think for a minute, I'll take a pause of one minute. Yes, anybody could do that. So let's let me just reveal the answer for this. So these could be the possible bits. W0 is minus 0.3, W1 is 0.5, and W2 is 0.5, right? And with these, when you put up these values of weights into this linear unit, the perceptron's output will be the same as the OR function's output. And that's how you could implement OR Boolean function as well. Right, so uh, you can try this out for the other NAND and NOR operations and we'll proceed further. So what we saw is that these perceptrons can represent all the primitive Boolean functions like AND, OR, NAND, NOR, but there are some Boolean functions which are, uh, which could not be represented using a single perceptron. I'm saying single perceptron, right? And that, Boolean function is XOR. Right? So when you see the XOR, see what happens in X, it will take the input X1, X2, right? So this uh, these are the possible combinations. And when you see the XOR, the, so this is 0, 0 is 0, this is 1, 1, and 0. So basically, when you try to plot it, what happens? So this is your 0. Zero, zero, right? So there will be zero, zero point is here. And this is, let's say one, and let's say this is one. So your point one, one point is here. And when you try to plot the remaining two points, it is zero, one. So this is X one, and let's say this is X two. So on X axis, I'm plotting X one. On Y axis, I'm plotting X two. Right. So this point that I have plotted, this is point zero zero, and this point which I have plotted with the red color, it is point one one, and which will be the point zero one. So x one is zero and x two is one. So this point x one is zero and x two. So this point is this one, and the third instance is this one, right? 
So let me, so the green color is one class, the red color is another class, right? And this is same as the non uh, separable classes, non linearly separable uh, set of examples. So we cannot have a linear line which can, which can perfectly classify these examples, right? Because these uh, examples which, uh, which, which belongs to uh, what XOR, XOR Boolean function, they are not linearly separable. And that's the reason that we cannot have a single perceptron which could be implemented, uh, which, which can implement this XOR gate. That means the mandatory condition for implementing any operation is the classes, the examples should be linearly separable. So a single percept, so what we learned is a single perceptron could not be sufficient in order to implement XOR function because the examples are not linearly separable. However, we can have network of many units which can represent this XOR function as we will see in the further part of this presentation. So let's proceed now. So up till now, now uh, we had seen that we have to learn the, those gates. So the examples I have covered so far, they have been small examples of gates or Boolean functions in which there were only three weights, right? So we could guess that what could be the possible weights, right? In the real world examples, you will have the applications where there could be thousands of weights. And in that case, it will not be feasible for a human being to guess the appropriate weights for all those, um, all those examples, right? So what do we need? We need some automated uh, technique with which we can learn these weights. And for that, we have these training rules, right? So, so, so the question over here is how to learn these weights automatically, right? Because that we will require in order to implement bigger applications. So there are two most popularly and very powerful training rules that are used for training these um, neural networks as well as perceptron. So one is perceptron training rule, the first one, and the second one is the delta rule, which uses gradient descent, right? And understanding of these two rules are extremely important because that will form the basis for training network of many units, right? So with this, let's proceed. Let's see the first rule, the perceptron training rule. This is our first rule. I hope my pace is fine with everyone. So this is the first rule, the perceptron training rule. So what, what is the objective? The objective is to learn the weights automatically. And it's a very simple training rule. What it says, it says that initialize all the weights with some random initial values, right? And then repeat these steps until the perceptron classifies all training examples correctly. And what are these steps? It says that iteratively apply the perceptron to each training example. For example, if in Boolean function, therefore there are four training examples, so you have to apply one by one to the perceptron uh, iteratively, all the examples. And modify the perceptron weights whenever it misclassifies an example. If it doesn't misclassify, that means the classification is perfect, you need not do anything, right? And how the, those weights will be updated, so your original weight is WNA, this WNA will be updated with small factor, which, which, which we denote by the small triangle WI. Let me call it del WI. And this del wi is given by this, this expression, which is eta multiplied by t minus so multiplied by xi. Where this t is the target output, that means this is what is required, what is the desired output, and this o is the perceptron's output, right? And if they are same, that means we have got what we wanted, right? And therefore, the weight should not be updated. So this, if your target output, let's say t equals to one and O 
the perceived round output is also 1, then in this case, this factor will be equals to 1 minus 1, 0. So this entire factor will be equals to 0. And no weight will get updated. But in case when your output, expected output is 1, and your perceptron's output is minus 1, that in that case, we need to update the weight. Right? So over here, we understood what is T, what is O. Xi is the corresponding input associated with this WI. And then eta, eta is called as the learning rate. Right? And it's a small constant. For example, point 0.1. So, using this update factor, this small triangle WI, we add that factor of weight into the existing weight using this equation and then updates whenever there is misclassification. So, let us understand whether this update rule will converge, right? Will converge in the sense it will come up with the correct weight vector, which will perfectly classify all training examples. So the convergence is, understanding convergence is very important. So it is uh, said that it can be proved that this update rule will converge towards successful weight values, provided your training data is linearly separable and eta is sufficiently small. This learning rate should be very, very small, right? And now let us understand this convergence. So as I said, when the training example is correctly classified, that means your T is same as O. That means when you want, when your T is equals to one, O is also equals to one, right? In the other case, when your t is equals to minus 1, o is also equals to minus 1. This is the desired result we want, right? In this case, this factor with which we update the weight is equal to 0, right, in both the cases, and therefore no weights will get updated. The other case when we, where we need to update the weight is more important to understand. See, if t equals to 1, but your perceptron outputs minus 1, but we want that our perceptron should output plus one. Therefore, what do we need to do? We need to increase the weight, right? So let's say for a, an example where xi is greater than zero. Let's say your uh, xi is equal to 0.8. And what is the output of the perceptron? Output of the perceptron is minus one. And what is the target output? Target output is one. And let's say we put the eta value as 0.1. So when you put all these values into this expression, eta multiplied by t minus o multiplied by its sign, you will get 0.1 multiplied by t is, so, so let me write, eta is equals to 0.1 multiplied by t, which is one, minus o, o is minus one, multiplied by xi. So point 0.1 multiplied by 1 plus 1, which is 2, multiplied by 0.8, which is equals to 0.16. So your actual rate, wi, will be increased, right, by this 0.16. And that's what we wanted. We wanted to increase the weight. So it will not be... Um, done immediately. I mean, it will not be done in just one step. So you have to repeat these steps. As I said in the algorithm, you have to repeat these steps many times and the algorithm will terminate only when all the training examples are correctly classified. So this is one time we have updated the weight over here. We may need to iterate over again and again in order to get the, the, the correct weight for all the training examples. So basically, the training, what we have learned in this case two is that when your perceptron outputs minus one, where you where it should output plus one, in that case, we need to increase the weight. And our training rule is designed in such a way that it gives a positive value to del wi, and therefore it will result in increase of weight. Right, and therefore we can 
conclude that this will converge this training rule will converge to the correct weight values right on the other hand again take the uh, case to uh, the other case of um, uh, the same ex same thing that means when there is misclassification but here the output target output is minus 1 and the perceptron outputs plus 1 so here your weights should be decreased so when you work out some example you will find that this gives a negative value and your weight final weight will be decreased with this factor and with all these cases uh, intuitively we can say that uh, this rule will converge to the correct weight vectors so that's how the weights could be learned automatically using perceptron training rule yeah so that was all about the perceptron training rule how it works here we are going to see its performance right so as i said that this perceptron rule finds a successful weight vector when the training examples are linearly separable but it can fail to converge if the examples are not linearly separable this is important right then in that case what should we do right in that case we sh we have a second training rule called as the delta rule so this delta training rule could be used to overcome this limitation of perceptron training rule and the key idea behind the delta rule is it uses gradient descent right and using gradient descent so what is gradient descent it will be clear in the next slide as i will explain you the concept but what you need to understand as as of now is we have another training rule called the delta rule which you make use of which makes use of gradient descent in order to learn the correct weight vectors so now let us see what is gradient descent So I hope my face is fine with everyone and everyone is with me. Okay, thank you. So let us understand gradient descent. So in order to uh, understand gradient descent, we will be considering this simple linear unit. Remember, we have drawn this perceptron, which consists of two units. One is this linear unit. Linear unit's output goes to this threshold unit. Right? So this is the linear unit. And this is the thresholded unit, threshold unit. So we are considering this linear unit and therefore the output is computed using this linear function as we had seen earlier so we want to learn these weights to minimize the squared error right we want to learn the weights such that it will minimize the squared error and what do we mean by squared error it is given by this expression one by two summation d belongs to capital d td minus od whole square where this d is the set of training examples it could be 1000 5000 or 10000 depending upon how large your data set is right so what essentially this expression is doing let me explain you the meaning of this expression this is the target output for any training example td and this is the linear units output od so we are computing the error in the output using td minus od and we are doing it uh, and then we are taking it square and we are doing this for all the training examples and summing them up and then finally it is being divided by two right so this is the total error that in the output that we get and we want to minimize it 
and we denote this error function by e of bracket objective. So our objective is to minimize this total error. Or in other words, I can say our objective is to learn the weights such that this total error will get minimized. Right, so we have to learn the weights which will minimize this squared error. And that is done using the gradient descent. So let's see. So gradient descent could be understood easily with the help of this diagram, which is shown in this slide. Here we could see that there is W0, this one, two weights have been considered here. W0 and W1, which are plotted on these axis, as you could see, on vertical axis, the error functions value is computed, right? So, and as we know that we, in this gradient descent also, or in delta rule also, we start with some initial random weights, which are assigned to these W0 and W1. And let's say when we assign some initial random weight values, to these W0 and W1, it so happens that the error function's value comes out somewhere here, around 50. Then what this gradient descent does is it, um, it, 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 it updates these weights in small steps in every iteration and in such that this error function's value will get reduced every time. So after several iterations, what will happen that these weights will be updated in such a way that these error functions will reach to the best possible value, which is zero in this case. And that's precisely we wanted. We wanted to update these weights such that this error function's value will eventually become the best possible minimum value. And that best possible minimum value is known as the global minimum. Oh, let me just rub this out. Global minimum, right? To give you a simpler, even simpler example, I think this is a simple one, but to give you an even simpler example, let's consider this in two dimensional space. Suppose here we have considered only one weight value W and its corresponding weight uh, function. So W is plotted on X axis, error functions value is plotted on Y axis. So let's say I take some, uh, when I initialize W with some initial value, initial random value, its value happens to be something over here. So this point on this error functions curve happens to be over here. That means the value of W that I have chosen is this, this value I have chosen, initial, my initial value. And therefore, the error functions value happens to be this. So let me just give some values over here. One, two, three, four, five, six, and so on and so forth, right? And here also we have one. Some uh, small values I will choose 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and so on and so forth, right? So let's say any initial value of W happens to be somewhere here around 0.2. And for that, the error function's value is somewhere above five. So what the gradient descent does, it, it updates this weight, this very small amount. And when it updates the weights from, let's say from 0.2 to somewhere here, somewhere here, so this value will be this. So this change in the error functions will take place. We have updated W with a little amount and therefore the error functions value is reduced by, uh, by another a small amount, but there is a decrease in the error functions value and that's what we wanted. And this step, this process will be repeated several times. So again, you change the value of W a little bit. So maybe now, so keep, so you change the value of W a little bit, with that, what will happen? The error functions 
value will also be updated. So this small triangle. Again, you change the value a little bit. The error functions value will also be updated. So this. Let me just rub this out. This. So keep on doing so when you come over here, right? So this will again come down, right? Like this, like this over here, over here, over here until you reach somewhere here, which is the best possible value for the error function. And you have reached the global minimum. That means you have reached to a point where error is the lowest. If you go beyond this point, error will keep on increasing. And that essentially is the point where you need, where you know that you can stop run, running the gradient descent because the error is now increasing, right? So that is the stopping point for the gradient descent also. So basically what we are doing is we are initializing the weight with some initial random value, it's very small value, and we are updating the weight with a very small amount. And because we update the weight with a very small amount, uh, the error functions value will also get reduced with some small amount. And that step is repeated several times until we reach to the global minimum. And that is what we wanted to, to, to have. That means we wanted some weight vector with which the error functions value is minimum. So that the classification uh, 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 would be with, with the best possible approximation. Right, so what essentially is being done over here is we are trying to reduce this error function E with respect to every W, right, every W. And this, uh, uh, this, this also means that we have to take the derivative of this error function A with respect to, to every W, then only it will be minimized. So this slope is nothing but the uh, derivative, right? The gradient or slope, these are one and the same thing. So what do we want? We want to uh, minimize this error function E with respect to every W. And that means we need to take the derivative of this error function E with respect to every W. And that's precisely is done over here in gradient descent that we take the derivative of this error function E, E same with respect to every W. And when you want to see that with what factor the weight is updated for each individual weight WI, then it will be equals to minus eta del E divided by del WI. Right? That you have to do for every width, right? So once you learn, once you know the expression, once you know the value of this expression, which is minus eta, del del wi of e, then you can simply use the weight update rule and add this factor, small triangle wi into that and your weight will be up updated, right? So what do we need to do now is we need to co compute this derivative of E with respect to every W. So let's see how do we do that. So we need to compute this derivative of E with respect to W. And this derivative is, this E is nothing but your sum of, uh, your square error, right? This x squared error. This function we has we had already seen one by two summation, ed minus od whole square. So that's we have to take the derivative of this expression with respect to wi. So we'll take the constant out. So one by two and summation is out, and then derivative of td minus od whole square. So this will be is something x square. So this this entire expression if I consider is as x. So it's something x derivative of x square is two x. So that's that's what is written. So 2x and the derivative of this x again. This OD is nothing but your linear functions, linear units output, which is nothing but uh, the linear combination of weights and its size, right? So I can write this OD with this 
I can replace this OD with this, which is basically says that this linear output is computed using the linear combination of weight as well as X inputs, right? So when you take the derivative of this uh, expression, what happens? All the constant uh, will become zero. So this TD is a constant over here. All other weights uh, happens to be constant except WI. So only that term will remain. So minus X ID. So the meaning to say is that what this uh, uh, says is only the input corresponding to WI will remain, others will become zero. So I think this is part of calculus. And if you recall calculus, you would have understood it. So the expression essentially is very much close to what we had in the previous, uh, previous case, right? So it's basically the error dd minus od multiplied by this x and we have this so this this factor we have computed this factor we have computed we will put it here and that will become our this uh, update factor so putting all these Together, the gradient descent algorithm looks like this. So all these steps are already explained. I will just put everything together and explain it in one go. So gradient descent takes training examples as input and the learning rate, right? Each training example is a pair. We know that which is x vector and t. Why is it is x vector? Because input will have multiple, multiple features. Right, as I said, the patient will have its age, gender, blood pressure, etc. So X is a vector and T is whether the patient is of low risk or whether the patient is of high risk. So this is already given in the training example. Because this comes under supervised learning, the labels are given to you. Right? And your eta is the learning rate. As I said, this will be very small value, uh, for example, 0.05. So what we have to do is, as I said, initialize every weight w to some small random value. And until the termination condition is met, we have to repeat these steps. We have to initialize each del wi to zero, right? And then what we have to do is, for each training example, we have to feed it into the linear unit, the x inputs, and compute the output O. Right, and for each linear unit weight wi, we need to compute this factor, which is the update factor, using the expression that we have derived using gradient descent, which is e t minus o x i. Right, and then you update the corresponding weight by adding this factor into wi, and this says it says the algorithm says that you have to repeat these steps until the termination condition is met so when the termination condition will met any guesses the termination condition will met when your error reaches to the global minimum right that means after that if you update the weight your error will increase and you will come to know that it is this is the stopping point of the gradient descent algorithm Right, so that was all about the gradient descent algorithm. Let's see the convergence properties of the gradient descent. See, um, it says that because the error surface contains only a single global minima, that means it is something like this, where there is only one single global minima. There could be error functions where it could be something like this. There could be multiple local minima and one single global minima, right? So what it says, because the error surface contains only a single global minimum, this algorithm will converge to a weight vector with minimum error. So because of the property of this error function, that 
it is it's a convex function it has only one global minimum the gradient descent algorithm is guaranteed to converge to the best possible weight vector So choosing an appropriate error function is, is, is very important. So the squared error function that we have chosen, it has this property of having global minimum. So up till now, we have studied two rules for training the, uh, net, uh, training the network, that means perceptron or the linear unit. So let us, See uh, how the, the remarks on these two training rules, that means uh, where they could be applied, in which cases they could be applied. So, and its performance as well. So the key difference between these two algorithm is that, or the training rules are that, that the perceptron training rule, the first rule that we studied, it update weights based on the error in the thresholded perceptron. Right, whereas the delta rule updates the base based on the error in the unthresholded part that is linear combination of the inputs. Right, so that is the that is one difference. And now let us see the convergence properties. So the perceptron training rule converges as we had already seen after a finite number of iterations, and when the perfect the training examples are perfectly classified and it will it will converge and we have seen its proof as well in the previous slide that it will converge after application of a finite number of iterations of training rule to the correct weight values and all the training examples will be perfectly classified in case of perceptron training rule the first rule that we studied Whereas in case of the delta rule, it delta rule converges towards minimum error that we had seen, right? It converges towards minimum error and it is comparatively slow. It requires unbounded, it may require unbounded time, but it also converges regardless of whether the training data are linearly separable or not, right? Whereas the first rule requires that the training data should be linearly separable. I think these two points are extremely important. If you have understood all the concept thought so far, so you should be able to relate these two, these two points. Yeah, so I will take a two minutes pause if there are any questions so far. So any questions? So if there are no questions, I, I will proceed further with multilayer networks and the back propagation algorithm. So here an example of multilayer network is shown on the left hand side of the slide, you could see a multilayer network the task of this network is to distinguish among 10 different classes 
of spoken words which contains h and d for and with different vowels for example head head hood etc and the input for this multilayer network is uh, two features of speech signal right so we could see the corresponding decision surface of this neural network or multilayer network the decision surface as we could see is highly non linear so here the ten classes are shown with the different notations the triangle some the triangle squares are used so just to um, get a, a little bit idea about the decision surface so you, you could see some points over some instances over here which belongs to one class for example they may be belonging to class uh, head this part this part belongs to another class this part belongs to another class and so on and so forth so all in all what we could see is the decision surface is highly non linear so this multilayer networks have this nice property of uh, representing the non uh, linear functions and these and why uh, this is a good property because the non linear functions are much more expressive as we could see that we could have 10 different classes over here which could be represented using this multilayer network which could be distinguished by this multilayer network right so the question is what type of unit basic unit shall we use as the basis for constructing multilayer networks right what should be the basic building unit for these multilayer networks can we use the linear unit as we had seen or can we use the perceptron in its entirety consisting of both linear unit as well as the threshold unit the answer for both the questions is no and the reason is that we need some properties in the output that means the first property that we need is your output should be a linear uh, your output should be a non linear function of the input then if your output is a non linear function of input then only we could represent non linear decision surfaces so that is the first thing we want and the second thing that we want is the output should be differentiable with the input values the output should be a function which is differentiable with the with its input so these are the properties which are required and therefore we cannot use uh, these two over here so what is the solution the solution is to use the sigmoid unit the sigmoid unit let's understand what is the sigmoid unit first of all and then we will see its nice properties so let's see the sigmoid unit is presented over here you have to see it very carefully because some part is same as the perceptron as we had seen for for example this half part as you could see this up to this linear unit it is same as the perceptron that we had seen it is it is essentially a perceptron the only difference is that in that we have a different threshold function here we have a different threshold function the threshold function here that we are using is called as the sigmoid function right and i will, i have also told you the reason that why we are using sigmoid function because it has some nice properties as we will also see in the next slide as well so it is the, it essentially is a perceptron with a different threshold function which is which here we are using as sigmoid function there are other possibilities also to use for example tan h is also a function which is used over here but this is most commonly used one so sigmoid function is denoted by the sigma so so let's understand it systematically so you have as earlier we you have this input features corresponding weights bias unit bias width compute the linear combination or linear function for these inputs and weights let's call it net give this net as input to this sigmoid unit the sigmoid unit which is denoted by the sigma will compute the sigmoid function which is given by the sigma of z is given by 1 upon 1 plus e to the power minus c right so you so this is the sigmoid function 
So what is the uh, nice properties of this? It is easily differentiable. That is the first thing. And second thing is it actually covers a whole range of uh, continuous values. So as we could uh, see with this, with the help of this plot, that it covers all the possible values from minus infinity to plus infinity. So let us understand this. So this is the expression, right? For sigmoid function, sigma of z is equals to one upon one plus e to the power minus z. So when z tends to infinity, right? Plus infinity, that means towards this right side. When you put z equals to infinity into this expression, you will find that sigma of z is equals to approaching to one. So this is approaching to one towards here. And when z equals to minus infinity, put this minus infinity into this expression, you will find that sigma of z is approaching to zero. So you can see over here towards minus infinity, this equals to zero. And when you are z equals to zero, right, the sigma of z is equals to 0.5. So z is zero over here. Sigma of z is 0.5. So it's a continuous function which covers the whole range of values. And the second thing is, is it is easily differentiable, right? So these are the properties we wanted to have in the basic primitive unit for designing multilayer networks. So sigmoid function is a very um, useful function or appropriate function to use in this case. As I said, it is differentiable and it's uh, getting its derivative is just two to three steps. When you take the derivative of the sigma function, you'll find it is equals to. So ddx of sigma of x is equals to sigma of x into one minus sigma of x. I want you to derive it at your end later after the completion of this lecture. Just two to three steps and we'll get this. Right. So, so now we know that we can use the sigmoid unit in order to build the multilayer networks. And now we can derive the gradient descent rule for training one sigmoid, one sigmoid unit. Right. Or multilayer networks of many sigmoid units. And when we do so, that means when we um, when we derive the gradient descent rule for multilayer networks of many sigmoid units, we use the back propagation algorithm for that. Right? So we would be studying the back propagation algorithm as well. But before that, let us take an example of multilayer network. Right? So as I said earlier, that XOR is a function whose decision surface is nonlinear. Right, and because its decision surface is non-linear, a single perceptron or single threshold unit. So when I'm saying threshold unit, right? When I'm uh, sorry, when I'm saying sigmoid unit, you have to imagine this entire uh, thing where this linear as well as the sigmoid function is is present. So what I was saying, I was saying that as XOR function is um, is such that that its um, instances are not linearly separable. A single perceptron or a single sigmoid unit could not be sufficient to represent this operation. So, what is the solution? The solution is to add extra layers, right? So, how to do that? So, we have this extra layer over here. Where your inputs are x1, x2, and you want to compute this XOR Boolean function. So what you would be doing is you have added this extra layer where you are initially computing the NOR of these inputs and end of these inputs, and whatever the output of this NOR, let's call it output one. And what is the whatever is the output of this end, let's call it output two. So these will become two inputs. To this NOR operation, which is written at outside of this bracket. So you take those outputs of internal units and give as input to the this NOR 
and the final function will be nothing but its node. That could be verified with the help of truth table. So, uh, when we talk of the multilayer networks, how a multilayer network will look like in this case. So, let's see. So, you have this x1, you have this x2, right? And you have this, so I'm, I'm, so this, 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 this becomes your in, input layer. And you also have this X zero, right? Let me just write, write in the alignment of this so that we can say that this is entire is this. Let me write. x0 so this becomes your input layer and then we will feed this to somewhere here this nor and and, and nor and and so let's this is my sigmoid unit and this is also my sigmoid unit so x1 will go here x2 will also go here x0 will also go here their corresponding bits will also go here, right? And this is your NOR. Now this is your AND. This AND will also take input this X1, this X2, and this X0. And the corresponding weights, this let's call it um, x uh, w0. But this w0 and this w0 is different. So this let's call it w01, let's call it w11, w21, let's call it w02, w12, and w22. Right? So we are calling this as unit one. So nor is unit one. And and is unit two, right? And therefore we have written w zero one, w uh, one one, and w two one. Where the second part is denoting the unit. For the for the uh, second unit, we have written the weights as as w. What we have written. We have written W02, W12, and W22. The so second part is noting the unit to which the weight is going, right? So this NOR, and then, then this NOR will give some output. And will also give some output. So this output will now finally go to this output layer, which is NOR. Right, let me uh, draw the arrow properly so that it will lead to this NOR as input. So I'll rub this out and draw again. So this NOR will require two inputs. So it will go here, it will go here, and it will also require its bias. Right, so this bias will also go here. And this will be nothing but your XOR. And each of these units, NOR and, and in the middle layer, and this NOR in the output layer, they are nothing but the sigmoid units. So let me just now show in the uh, layer wise. So this becomes your input layer, right? Because you have this input feeding to the network, then you have this middle layer, which is called as the hidden layer because why it is called hidden layer because its output is not visible at the uh, to the user right so this is your hidden layer and this is your output layer 
here also you will have uh, these are your inputs and here you will have weights right so some uh, weight values you have to write some weights some notations also we have to use i think i have written it on the next slide with some notation so essentially i hope the idea of multi layer network is clear when we have the non linear decision surface then we cannot have a single perceptron or single sigmoid unit which would be sufficient to represent that function and therefore we need multi layer network and those functions in which the decision boundaries or decision surfaces are non linear require deeper networks and um, for that uh, for example xor network will look like this right so i think i have written everything over here in this slide the corresponding weights with the appropriate layers that you could see and i hope this idea that i have told you is very much clear that this is the sigmoid unit that we had seen this sigmoid unit can also be represented using a single neuron where we have shown this linearity as well as this sigmoid functions sorry into one circle which uh, so these two diagrams are same they are one and the same right and therefore when i say that this is my nor right so when i give inputs x0 x1 x2 to this my nor neuron unit then it computes the linear uh, function over the input and weight vector then it fed it to the sigmoid unit and then the output is generated right so using this this diagram is drawn so every unit so here this is the sigmoid unit this is the sigmoid unit and this is the sigmoid unit so these three circles where i have picked they are these sigmoid units whereas all these others are input or bias so basically uh, we have come up with the network what we need to do now is we have to learn these bits so i have i think i have worked out and come up with these bits but this is done manually we want a technique with which we can learn these bits in multi layer network automatically right and for that we have the back propagation algorithm right so uh, we'll see the back propagation algorithm and how does it run so it's quite so it also uses the gradient descent let's see the algorithm and try to understand it so this back propagation algorithm is for network containing two layers of sigmoid units so i so i think we can very well understand this algorithm with the help of this xor network in which we have, have two layers of sigmoid units one on the hidden layer we have sigmoid units and uh, one on the output layer we have sigmoid unit right so let us understand so this back propagation algorithm takes input as, as training examples learning rate eta number of input units number of output units and number of hidden units right so what essentially it is doing is in this part it is building the network right so everything is given each training example is up here as we already discussed in gradient descent also x vector comma t where x is the vector of input network input values and t is the vector of target network output values there could be multiple output neurons in the output layer Theta is the learning rate with some small value, right? And I explained you about n in, n out, n hidden. These are number of input, number of output, and number of hidden units. So using all these, you have to create a network. We also call it as the feed-forward network. So let's say we have created this network, right, for the given function which we want to approximate. So what you have to do, the algorithm actually starts from this point after the network building. Initialize all network weights with some small random values between, let's say, 0 0.05 minus 0 0.05 to plus 0 0.05, right? And now then you have to repeat these steps until the termination condition is met. We'll see what is the termination condition later, but let's see what are the steps. 
So what it says for each training example, so what, let me explain you the intuitive meaning of this back propagation algorithm. What it actually, what it essentially does is it takes all the training examples one by one and it inputs the uh, instance X vector to, to the network and computes the output for every unit, be it the hidden unit or be it the out, output unit. It computes the output for every unit in the network, right? And after that, it computes the error, right? So error at the output layer will be computed using a similar expression as we had seen in case of gradient descent, which is TK minus OK. We are denoting the error here by del K. So the error in the output unit K will be denoted by TK minus OK, where T is, TK is the target, OK is the output of the unit, which is multiplied by the derivative of sigmoid function OK one minus OK, OK into one minus OK, right? So the error in the output unit is computed using this expression. And uh, then you have to compute the error in the hidden unit. Let's denote the hidden unit by, by H. So error in the hidden unit is denoted by del H. See, in order to compute the error, we require the target value so that we can subtract from it the predicted value so that we can come to know what is the error. But the target value is only available at the output unit. It is not available to the hidden units. So in that case, how to compute the error for the hidden units? So for that, the error is error in the output units are propagated back to the hidden units, right? So you could see this, this is a simple expression which says that what is the influence of hidden unit H in each of the output units, right? So that error, those errors of the output units are propagated back to every hidden unit and for every hidden unit, so for example, just let's see, this is the hidden unit H and there are, let's say, multiple output units. So what is the error in this? Let's say del K1, del K2, and so on and so forth, whatever number of units are there. So the error of each of these output units are propagated back in order to find out what is the influence of this hidden unit on the errors of these output units and they get multiplied by the corresponding weights which are present over here. And that's why this, so error is propagated back towards the input layer. So once you compute the error for each of the output units, as well as each of the input units, you can simply update the rule using the same expression, which is adding this factor. And this factor is given by eta del j x j i for any, uh, for any unit J, right? So this is about the errors. Now we will see in all in all how this algorithm works. So let's assume that there are 1000 training examples. Right, so 1000 training examples are there. Each training example will be fed to the the multi-layer network and the error will be computed for each of the units present in hidden layer as well as the output layer. Error, error will then uh, be propagated back and this weight factor will be computed for each of the units. And weight, all the possible weights will be updated, right? All possible weights for the between input layer to hidden layer, hidden layer to the output layer, all those weights that are there in the network, they will get updated. And this will be done for all the possible training examples. So if there are 1000 examples, all 1000 examples will be, will be fed to the network and, and the error will be computed and weights, all weights will be updated. Once we complete this one iteration, we call this epoch. So we have completed one epoch and this, there could be multiple epochs, many thousands of epochs, right? Let's say, uh, let's just keep it a small value, 500. 
let's say 500 epochs are there, then 500 times all the training examples will be fed into the network and the um, error will be computed, weights will be updated. And because this uses gradient descent internally, the it will eventually come to some minimum error. So does it really find the global minimum or not? That we will see in the performance. So that is the basic idea about the back propagation algorithm. So let's see uh, whether it finds the global minimum or not. So that is again a very interesting thing over here. So the back propagation algorithm implements a gradient descent search and it iteratively reduces the error as we have seen in case of the delta training rule, right? So it also starts with some initial random weights, keep on updating them such that the error value will get reduced. The total error value will get reduced. The error surface for multi-layer networks may contain many different local minima, as I said. So as I said, the function could be, error function could be like this. So this, this is the lowest uh, value over here. So this is the global one. Whereas this, if you come across this or this or this, these are not the global minima. That means if you come to this point and your algorithm stops, you have not got a weight vector which will give you the minimum error. Right? So the errors, meaning to say is that the error surface for multi-layer network may contain many different local minimum, minima as I have shown in the figure over here. Right? Therefore, the back propagation algorithm um, is only guaranteed to converge towards some local minima in E and not necessarily global minima. So it does not guarantee the global minimum. Uh, it may uh, stop when you have encountered a local minima, right? Despite all these things, it has been found that in practice, this back propagation algorithm works very well, right? And the kind of accuracy that you get with these with this back propagation algorithm in most of the uh, networks today, uh, uh, be it uh, be it any network CNN, etc., the back propagation algorithm used and it works very very well in practice. So that was all about neural network basics, right? And maybe deeper networks like CNN would be covered in um, subsequent classes. So all these contents are from the Tom Mitchell books, Machine Learning. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. Questions. Please put forward your doubts, your questions, whatever you have. Either you can put it on the chat box or you can unmute your mic. Any questions? Please do fill the attendance form also, which is very much similar to the, which is the same as the feedback form. Okay, if there are no further questions, anything, anything you would like to ask? Please feel free to ask, I will try to answer. Okay, so Professor Shan Mugam Priya Singh, clear. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Yeah, if there are no questions, you can give me a quick feedback over here. How did you find the session? Okay, great, Durga Devi, ma'am. Thank you so much. Do fill that feedback Thank form you, also. Yeah, and I would share that feedback from with, all, with all the experts. Thank you so much. It was a very nice session, uh, Dr. Nishat, as is clear from the comments also. Thank you so much for accepting the invitation. Thank you. Uh, we would meet again uh, after the post lunch at 1.30 p.m. 
please don't miss the session. Thank you so much. I am closing the meeting now and I would uh, start the meeting again at 1.30. Okay, thank you, ma'am, and thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank How you, to everybody. fill the feedback? We have to use the same uh, link? Yes, it's the same link with a different speaker. Okay, ma'am, okay. Thank you, ma'am. You can use the same link. It's there on the WhatsApp group also. Okay, ma'am, okay. We will use. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. We'll meet at 1.30.